Good morning. Good to see you this morning. It's great to be here at, uh, where am I? <laughs> uh, some Sundays it's like that. I'm the associate at the Austin Baptist Association. Uh, I work with Dr. David Smith, who will be here in a couple of weeks to preach to you. This is my retirement gig. I work for the association as a full-time volunteer, nearly. Uh, we have uh, three campuses that have been given to us by churches that have died, literally. And so we operate those three camp campuses, and we have 12 churches in those three campuses. And one of my functions is to make sure that they have their spot uh, for Sunday morning, Sunday afternoon, Saturday night. We have one that meets Saturday afternoon in those campuses to make sure that the bills are paid and the facilities are functional. Uh, and the association does pay me a little stipend to do that part of it. The other part of it is I act as treasurer and my main job is to keep David Smith out of trouble. <laughs> I failed at that. But uh, David's a great guy. I want to thank your staff. Uh, Ryan, or Matt contacted me. Ryan Harris contacted me. Matt contacted me. Gave me some information and some direction. I preach in a lot of churches. Have over the last 12 years. Uh, sometimes you, you know you're going to a church and you don't know anything about it. Uh, sometimes you have to look it up to get the address. Don't know anything about it uh, until you get there. And I appreciate uh, uh, Matt sending me some information about the church and they're greeting me and Ryan greeting me. It's, it's good. And this man over here, Brother Stone, was a member of a church I pastored and he's still going to stay in here. <laughs> what, can't, you can't lose on that. I want to, what I wanted to talk to you about this morning is more of a testimony than anything. Uh, you know, it's tax time. And so we're all filing our taxes. And if you itemize your taxes, you're looking at how much did you give to your church last year? And my wife and I always sit down and we try to analyze that. And did, we, did we do what we're supposed to do? And, and why? Why did we do what we're supposed to do? Why did we give to our church? Uh, my wife still works and has a good income. I have an adequate retirement and Social Security and a little stipend here and there. And so we have to try to figure out did we do what was right by the Lord's work last year? The Bible says that God loves a cheerful giver. Listen to what he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7. Let each one do just as he has purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Are you glad about what you did with what God has given to you in the past. Are you a happy? Are you a cheerful giver? Now, the Bible says that God loves a cheerful giver. And that word cheerful is really translated correctly to be hilarious. And I'm sure some of our giving is hilarious to God. But it shouldn't be. Our giving should make us happy. It should make us feel good about who we are and about what we're doing. Now, if you notice in that verse of Scripture, it says three things. It says, first of all, not grudgingly or reluctantly, out of grief, like, oh, I wish I didn't have to write that check. Some years ago, I remember I was on my way to church and 
stopped at a red light and a car pulled up alongside of me and they were towing this big, beautiful boat. Now, I'm not a real boat person. But I looked at that boat and my thought was, I wonder how they afford that boat. I couldn't afford that boat. And I said that to my wife and she looked at me and said, well, if we didn't tithe, we could afford it. And that was true. But you know what? I bet that boat is on somebody's scrap heap someplace. And what I've given to God's work over the years is not on a scrap heap. It's doing God's business, wherever it is. And so that's what I want to talk to you about. And and then he says, not under compulsion. Am I giving because I was forced to give? Am I giving because I was forced to give? When I was a kid... I grew up in New Jersey. By the way, the three trees, you know, how do you get to where you are? How does a guy who grew up in New Jersey end up spending three quarters of his life in Texas? God does that. But anyway, I was a kid, and my brother and I went to Sunday school, and we went to church at this church. And a lady came by one day, to talk to my parents about what they were going to give to the church. Now, they didn't go, but, you know. And so she asked my dad, and he said, well, how much do you give? And she looked at him and said, well, I give my time. Well, I'll tell you, that wasn't much of an inspiration to my dad to give to the church. Should we give our time? Yeah. Yeah. But that's not all. And the third thing he says in there is that each one, each one in this verse, each one, that covers everybody. It covers the older couple. It covers the middle-aged couple. It covers the younger couple. It covers the single mom, the single dad, the single person. It covers everybody. It covers everybody. Everybody who belongs to God has an obligation to give to God's work, to support God's work. So there are seven things. You wonder where I was going. I got those other three in there. There are seven things that I want to mention to you this morning. The first is there is liberation in obeying God. In Leviticus 27.30 it says... Thus all the tithe of the land, of the seed of the land, of the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. It is holy to the Lord. Now here's the essence of of how I've tried to live my life. I've tried to find out what God was doing and get there. I've tried to find out what God was doing and be a part of what God was doing. In life. And, and when we give to support God's work, we're giving to support what God is doing. We purposed in our heart. He goes on to say, determine in your hearts in biblical times the heart was the seat of the life. And the question is, do I want to be obedient to God? Do I want to do what God wants me to do. How many of you ladies have ever prepared a casserole dish and brought it to a supper at a church? Okay? Yeah. So I'll tell you a story about that. I prepare my dish, I bring it to the supper at the church, and uh, put it out there, and when I go to get my dish, it's gone. Somebody took my dish. And so I think, well, you know, they'll bring it back. Next time we have a supper, my dish will come back. So sure enough, the next time we have a supper, I look there on the table, and there's my dish, and it's got somebody else's stuff in it. So I think, well, you know, they'll leave it. They, they, they realized when they got home that that wasn't their dish. And so I go to get my dish, and it, it's gone. Again, oh, this isn't right. So the next time we have a supper, there's my dish, and I'm going to watch it until I see who picked it up. 
And when they pick it up, I go to them and I say, that's my dish. And they look at me and say, dish, dish, dish. That's all you're interested in is the dish. You ever hear anybody say that about the church? Money, money, money. That's all the church is interested in is money, money, money. No, that's not true. God's work has to be supported by God's people. God gives us all we have, everything that we have. And yet some people refuse to return anything to him. Some of God's people refuse to return anything to him. 2 Corinthians 9.13 Because of the proof given by this ministry, they will glorify God for your obedience to your confession of the gospel of Christ and for the liberality of your contribution the liberality of your contribution to them and to all. So, first of all, there's liberation in obeying God. Secondly, investing in God's kingdom is more effective than investing in anything else. In Matthew chapter 14 and in John chapter 6, there are two events. They may be the same event. They may be different events. But they're the feeding of the thousands. You remember them. Jesus is speaking to this large group, 5,000 people, probably more than that because they didn't count women in those days. Thank God things are changing. And he says to the disciples, they, they say to him, well, well, the crowd's getting hungry and there's no McDonald's nearby or Sonic or what, what are you going to do? And he said, well, Let's feed them. Now, this is my, I, I love to put things in my story. My way tells it. Let's feed them. So what do you have? So they bring a boy, and he's got some loaves and some fishes, and he said, okay, well, let's feed them. And he said, well, Lord, what are these, this, my, so many? And, and Jesus says, line up. And so he begins to take, and he breaks off a piece and gives it to each of the 12 disciples, a piece of the bread and a piece of the fish. And Peter's on the end of the line. Peter was a big guy. Big hands. I don't have big hands. I got small hands. Big hands. And Peter looks down in the palm of his hand and he sees a piece of the loaf of bread and a piece of a fish in his hand. And, he, and, and John's standing next to him and gives him the elbow and says, just do what the master said. And so Peter goes out among the crowd. He's assigned an area. And he goes out and the first guy that he comes to is a big man, big guy. And Peter looks down at his hand, and he looks down at this guy, and he says, he's thinking, this isn't going to work out too well. And so he breaks off a piece of the piece of bread and a piece of the piece of fish, and he puts it in the guy's hand, and the guy looks at him, and Peter says, shut up and just pass it down. <laughs> and so the guy breaks off a piece of the piece of the piece of the bread and a piece of the piece of the piece of the fish and passes it down. And they're all satisfied because of what God did in that. So let me tell you, that's what God does. He takes the little bit that we give and he blesses it. Do you know what blessing means? It means putting in something that wasn't there before and that we can't put in. Only God can do it. And he blesses it. And he blesses all over the world. North American Mission Board. He uses the North American Mission Board. We're starting churches all over the country through the North American Mission Board. The church that I'm a member of in North Austin, Hillcrest Baptist Church, we are sponsoring a pastor in Seattle, the Mountain Church in a Seattle suburb. We're sending money every month to him to support him in the ministry in the church that he started there in the Seattle area. We visited Seattle a couple of years ago, about a year and a half ago. A group of us from the association visited up there and picking up and sponsoring new church starts in that area 
as a part of our ministry, part of church's ministry to that area. So God does things with it that we can't do. So then the third thing that I want to suggest to you this morning is that I know when I give to my church that I'm making an eternal investment. Matthew 6, 19 and 20 and 21 says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in or steal. For there where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So if I invest in something with my money, ultimately it's going to be gone. I can't take it with me when I go. I don't have a 401k, but I do have a little account. Stock market went down, what, 1,200 points a couple of weeks ago? I didn't look at it. First of all, I didn't want to be depressed. But secondly, I just, it's money. God's going to take care of me. He's taken care of me all these years. He's going to keep on taking care of me in that way. Tithing is what I do. It's my investment. It's my investment and my wife's investment in God's work through our church. Part of that goes to the cooperative program. Part of that goes to the state convention. Part of that goes to the association if you're in my church. Part of that goes to Seattle. A part of that goes here. I mean, we we give about 16%, I think, of our budget goes to missions and organizations and things. So what I give, a part of that goes to support all of those things. I'm a cooperative program person, okay? I went to Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. It cost me $50 a semester. Yeah. (laughs) I went a long time ago. (laughs) But the reason for that is because of the cooperative program. I earned my doctor's degree from Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. I don't remember how much that one cost me, but it wasn't very much because I could afford it. I taught at Truett Theological Seminary. They didn't pay me very much. But training ministers because of the cooperative program, because of the money that comes in. So I give. Because it's an eternal investment. The fourth thing is that I'm symbolizing Christ's leadership over my life. Proverbs 3, 9 says, Honor the Lord from your wealth and from the first of all you produce. Tithing is symbolic way of honoring God. We honor God in many ways. We honor God in prayer. We honor God in obedience. We honor God in praise. Worship this morning. I enjoyed that worship service. I love to pray. I can't sing a note on note, but I love to praise God in that. We worship God in many ways, but should we not also honor God by our faithful support of God's work? Listen to what Exodus says. Exodus chapter 21, verse 5 and 6. But if the slave plainly says, I love my master, my wife, and my children... I will not go out as a free man. Then his master shall bring him to God, and then he shall bring him to the door or the doorpost, and his master shall pierce his ear with an awl, and he shall serve him permanently. I give because I belong to God. My ear is not pierced with an awl, but my heart is pierced with the cross. The cross of Jesus. I want to do everything I can to see that the cross of Christ is promoted wherever. Most everybody on my street knows who I am, that I'm a retired Baptist minister. Some of them barely wave when they go by, but, you know, it's okay. It's okay. 
having a hard time. I've got new neighbors. They don't speak English. Nobody in their house speaks English. But I'm waving, and I got one guy's name, and, you know, I'll get the opportunity sometime to share God's message. But because I belong to God, amen. The fifth thing is that it increases my faith. Proverbs 3.10 says, So your barns will be filled with plenty, and your vats will overflow with new wine. Let me make it clear. I do not preach a prosperity gospel. I don't say if you love Jesus and you give a tenth of your income, you're going to be rich. I say if you love Jesus, God's going to bless you in such a way that you may not have monetary wealth, but you'll have so much wealth in the life that you live. But you'll be blessed beyond anything that you could possibly imagine. The gospel. Malachi 3.10 says, Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house and test me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing until it overflow. And Luke 6.38 says, Give and it will be given to you good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. They will pour into your lap, for by your standard of measure will it be measured upon your return. We have to trust God. We have to trust God. I went through a period of time where I made a really good salary. And then I got laid off. I had to leave my church. I didn't make as much money. My wife and I still tie. We still tie. I got back up. She lost her job. She had a really good paying job. She lost her job. She was on unemployment for a while. We tied. We tied that unemployment check. We tied everything we got. She got another job. She didn't make near as much as she was making, but we tied. That's the standard. We tie. We give to God's work. God decides the amount that he's going to get. He's going to get a tenth of whatever I make, and he decides what I'm going to make ultimately. And so I give that to him. And the sixth thing is, I become God's instrument for supporting my church's ministry. I looked in your bulletin, and you've got a children's ministry, and you've got a youth ministry, and you've got a choir, and... My church has all those things. We have a children's ministry. I don't have any children anymore. Well, I have children, but they're not children. I don't have any youth. I spent so many summers out at youth camp out there that I thought, you know, I had a place that would, I'd be there forever. I think 30 years I went to youth camp with the youth. I don't have any youth anymore, but what I give to my church supports the youth. I don't sing. I've already told you that. My wife sings, plays in the bell choir, all that. But I support what we give, supports the music ministry of the church. It supports the administrative ministry of the church. It supports all of those things in the church. So let me sum up what I believe about that is 10% of what I get, I give to God. And then my wife and I prayerfully have decided over the years that we're going to give above the tithe. And so we have a number of ministries that we support. We have some friends who are foreign missionaries. They're now, searched, they're now stationed in Turkey. It's a volatile place. For years, we have supported their ministry over and above what we give to our church, over and above what our church gives. We have supported to them. They have used that money. They've chose, I told them they could do anything they want with it, buy ice cream, whatever they wanted. We just felt like we wanted to support them in that way. They have used it to train pastors. Every year they send me a letter and say, we did this many training conferences. You had a part in those training conferences. 
with missionaries all over the world. I have, I think, nine pictures of mission family up on my little, well, it's not a little desk, over my big desk at my house in my study of mission families that I know and that I supported through prayer. I don't give to all of them. I can't. I would if I could. I can't. So, it supports my church's ministry. And then, lastly, I know that my giving helps people. I know that my giving helps people. I, I noticed that you have ADRM back there, Austin Disaster Relief Ministry. I'm a certified Baptist General Convention of Texas Baptist man certified to go on, whatever. I, I believe in that kind of ministry. We give money to that when we can, when disaster happens. We support that because God has blessed us. God has given to us everything I have. God, God has given to me. And so I support whatever that, that, that is in God's ministry. You remember the guy that had the barns full? Wanted to build bigger barns? Remember what God said to him? He said, you fool. This night, your soul will be required of you. Fill out your income tax. Why did you give to your church last year? Why did you give to God's work? I hope and I pray that everyone here will prayerfully consider what they're doing for God's work. Are you doing the best that you can for God's work? I am a cheerful giver. I love it. I love to think about all the people that have been supported. Baptists have the greatest operation for supporting missions and all those other things through the cooperative program through the state convention. Let's pray together. Father God, I thank you for the opportunity to be here this morning to share this message from my heart to the heart of these folks. And I just pray, Father, that if there's someone here, first of all, that's never trusted you as Lord and Savior of their life, Lord, they, they, they can't help but through the music this morning of this church to understand that you love them, you care about them, you died on the cross. Wonderful children's story. Died on the cross for their sins. And Father, I pray if there's somebody who doesn't know you, that they'd be willing to open their heart to invite you to come in to be their love, be their Savior. And then, Father, those of us who are Christians this morning, I just pray, Father, that you'd lay it on our hearts that we would do the best we can to support our church and the ministries of our church with what you have given to us. Father, we're going to have an invitation in a moment. And Lord, maybe there's somebody here that needs to come and be a part of this church because you've led them here. You don't lead them to a pastor, you lead them to a church. I believe that. Lord. And they want to do that. And maybe there's somebody here who's never trusted you and they want to come and Make a public profession of faith to follow you in baptism. Lord, I just pray that you take the invitation time and bless it. In Jesus' name, amen. Chris is here at the front. God speaks to you. God moves in your heart. You do what God does.